these silver commercial bars that are needed for industry are being taken out of the market and used in industry. And therefore, you've seen the SLV uh, ebb and flow, as I said, but basically the offtake is there. Same thing with the COMEX registered category. Same thing with the LBMA. Hello again, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Silver Bullion Television, SBTV. I'm your host, Patrick Vieira. Part of the outreach team of Silver Bullion here in Singapore, where we want to help you truly secure your wealth. David Morgan joins us today. Affectionately known as the Silver Guru, David is a widely recognized analyst in the precious metals industry and consults for hedge funds, high net worth investors, mining companies, depositories, and bullion dealers. He is the publisher of the Morgan Report, a world class publication designed to build and secure wealth, and also the author of the Silver Manifesto, as well as a featured speaker at investment conferences worldwide. And we're delighted to have David Morgan join us once again today. Time to saddle up and silver up for David Morgan. David, welcome back to SBTV. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing well, and thanks for having me. Glad to have you back on. It's been a while. Uh, we got to make these... Uh, increments a bit shorter so hopefully we can uh we can do that yeah, david the the first the most obvious question is of course the metals prices the gold continues to hit all-time highs and silver it's, it's perking up a bit coming uh starting to go up price wise from the way you see it though what were the one or two or maybe three things that recently brought silver to to life well, that's a that's a bit of a tough one. This is opinion. Uh, one is that gold had broken out, and the two thousand dollar U.S. dollar marker became support rather than resistance. So gold is obviously making the next leg up, and how long it'll go, and where we'll get to, and how long we don't know, but we do know that it's taking place. So that just continued to, you know, manifest. And so the silver people were like, well, what's going on? And so somewhere along the line, some buddies decided to get in the silver market. And on the on the physical side is actually some European funds that took some pretty healthy amounts of silver in physical form and moved it into their fund. And that, I think, was the impetus to start to see the price move. The other part, of course, has been the fundamentals have been strong for well over a year, where we're seeing a supply deficit, which I'm waiting to, to see if the next silver reports from, you know, Metals Focus at the Silver Institute and then CPM Group and see what uh, Matt Watson has to say about it. But <clears throat> those three studies, I'm anxious to see uh, if the above ground stockpile is diminished or not. I believe it has, which means there truly is a deficit going on. And solar is just such a huge amount of offtake now where it's almost 30% of the market, at least by some analysis, it's that big. And, you know, you take 30% of any market, that's significant. So that's, I think, what brought it. It hasn't really been retail. Retail at this time has kind of been sitting on the sidelines. There are a lot of people that are new to the silver market that invested physically and paid very high premiums, even for like silver rounds. And now some of that's been sold back to the dealers or the wholesalers, and they're sitting on inventory. And the markups have been, or the premiums have been, you know, discounted or changed significantly to be very much smaller than they were a few, you know, months ago, where they were much higher. So it's kind of a difficult market to analyze from. Price keeps going higher, but the retail side's flush with inventory. What's taking place, and it's basically institutional support and futures trading. All right, we'll touch on a few of those things in, in just a bit. But you know, I was looking at the silver price in, in Japanese yen. It's hit all time new highs or modern highs anyway. Aussie dollar is about five Aussie dollars away from all time modern highs. Canadian dollars, I think about nine Canadian dollars away from new all time highs. Euros, about nine euros away from all time highs and so forth and so forth. But are we now on a visible path for silver to hit new all-time highs, perhaps in every major currency? 
I would say every major currency except the dollar. <clears throat> I think if we get to, I don't know what it would be because I don't look at the foreign exchange markets that often, but, you know, we get it in all the other currencies you mentioned, new highs, all-time highs. Uh, I don't think it would have a lot of effect on the market. I mean, it would in that jurisdiction, but when you see those all-time highs, many people, retail investors, are not going to say, oh, it's an all-time high. I'm going to sell my silver now for fiat. Most of those people are looking for even higher prices, and they're looking to you know, hold for, for higher prices. And the new buyers, as I mentioned a minute ago, are the institutions, and they really don't care what the price is. That sounds rather stupid, but it's actually the truth. Because in most instances, it's price inelastic to an institution. Now, not an institution that's buying for price appreciation, like a hedge fund. Should have said institution. Let me back that. Let me take that back or walk that back. Institutions are looking in the futures markets for or ETFs for price appreciation. Industrial users is what I meant to say. Industrial users are price inelastic, so they don't really care that much. So if they have to buy silver at 30 US dollars or 35 US dollars to put, you know, a tenth of an ounce into their product, it really doesn't affect the cost of that product. That's price inelastic. If it's only 0.1% of the product and becomes 0.2% of the product, they don't care if the price doubles. And that's the case for silver in so many instances, be it, you know, automobiles, be it um, something, even solar panels. It's not as big a percentage of the cost of a solar panel as people might think. So it's price inelastic. Like these industrial users really, do they care? Yes, yeah, somewhat, but they, it's an insignificant change for them, which is very beneficial to the silver market as a whole because they could come in and see the solar industry you know, double from what it was a few years back, and yet since it's price insensitive, it's not safe for these solar companies to say, oh, I got to cut back on the amount of solar panels. Silver cost me too much. No, it's full steam ahead. Keep going, baby. Pump these panels out. On the institutional side, that's different. But they do it basically with the futures markets, not with physical. There's some funds that do buy physical. And when you look at the biggest one, the SLV, it makes no sense. Because the silver price is going on a terror, and yet you see a depletion of the silver coming out of the SLV. Now that ebbs and flows, and I know there's been, you know, some pretty massive amounts of silver put back into the SLV. But on the aggregate, on the whole, basically where you would see silver now with all new time highs um, in most currencies, you would see a larger input into the silver SLV, and it would be above and beyond where it's ever been before, and it's not. It's much lower than where it's been before. So that begs the question, what's really going on? And I think the answer to that is that these silver commercial bars that are needed for industry are being taken out of the market and used in the industry. And therefore, you've seen the SLV uh, ebb and flow, as I said, but basically the offtake is there. Same thing with the COMEX registered category. Same thing with the LBMA. So where's that silver going? Well, you could uh, broad brush it and say uh, <clears throat> into semiconductors, automobiles, and solar panels. If you're enjoying this interview with David Morgan and I, please do subscribe and give it a thumbs up. And did you know that at Silver Bullion, there are six different types of accounts to fit your needs. To find out more, go to www.silverbullion.com.sg, click on the Sign Up tab, and choose from these six types of accounts. Or email me at patrick at silverbullion.com.sg, and I'll help to get you started. Yeah, okay, we'll touch on these things also. It, it, one one last question here with, with price. I was looking at a, a monthly chart for silver, and and I noticed um, there does seem to be some resistance at about that twenty eight dollar level. We saw it back in August of twenty twenty, and again in May of twenty twenty one, where silver touched twenty eight and found some resistance. 
we're at about that number again, 28. Do, do you think um we may hit that resistance again or, or is 28 some kind of significant number for, for silver? Well, it could be. I have to look at the chart, um, Patrick, to give you a really good answer, but I'll just assume that you're correct. But I want to add to that because 30 is the big number. Why is 30 the big number? Round numbers and commodities mean a great deal psychologically. It's almost exactly like the 2000 number in US dollars for gold. Once 2000 was at level, we can't get through, we can't get through it. When we get through, it falls back. We get through it, we fall back. 2000, 2000, 2000. Once that number becomes support and not resistance, then there's a whole new mindset, a whole new psychology. Gold is on its way, 2000 support. And it'll be the same thing with silver at 30. So we hit that round number and get through it and become support, which I said in the January issue, I thought we'd get to 30 this year. And whether or not it becomes support or not, I don't know. I didn't know in January. I still don't know. But the way things are going, it looks like that will happen this year. I don't think it's going to be immediate. Could fall off 28. I'm looking actually for an indicator to provide me for calling the intermediate top. And that's always tough to do especially if you're wrong, especially for people that pay you for your insights. But um, I see the other whites are coming up today. Platinum and Palladium are both making uh, 3.5% moves in a day. <clears throat> Usually when they come and are laggards, they, they're lagging. Silver's lagging gold. The other white metals are lagging silver. When they catch up, uh, so when I see $1,000 Platinum or thereabouts, that will probably be the intermediate top. So I'm giving away some of my insights. doesn't mean I'm right. So take it with a grain of salt, folks. But that's what I'm looking for. Yeah, I agree. Platinum is uh, looking pretty interesting as well. Um, but with um, silver moving up, you know, we're starting to see some, some movement with the gold and silver ratio. What number are you looking at with this ratio before, let's say, you or maybe some of us out there should should maybe consider uh, switching over from silver to, to gold? Well, that would be in the 30s. I mean, the one so far, it's already hit in this bull market was 33 to 1. So it didn't get to 30 to 1. So <clears throat> I would say under 40, you would want to probably switch from silver into gold. Uh, I wouldn't do it all, but, you know, people do what they do. I would take half of my trading position. Because it could get to 20 to 1 once we really get going here. But uh, I thought you were going to ask me a different question. Uh, when do you think, what ratio do you need for the gold-silver ratio to be for you to be convinced that silver is going to make its move? And that's 70 to 1. And we're not there yet. You know, 7 to 1 on uh, 70 to 1 on silver at, silver at 30, 7 times 3 is 21. So 70 to one ratio, gold would only be at 2100, and we're at 23 plus change right now, 2330. <clears throat> so, but that's what I want to see. I want to see silver above 30, and I want to see the ratio below 70 for us to really know that we are well on our way. And again, I think that will happen probably by the end of this year. Uh, these markets tend to accelerate. Uh, as they get stronger and hopefully not over accelerate, although they could, you know, ebb and flow again, move up really fast and then get a big smash. And then people that bought it at 28 and watch it go up to kiss 29 and change and then bang, it's back down to 26 in a week. Get disheartened. Oh my goodness. I never should have bought. It. I knew 28 was the top and blah, 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 blah. Talk themselves out of it. <clears throat> Maybe get out of the market. And then the market all of a sudden, two months later, is back at 30 and it gets over 30 and it stays there. And that's just an example. But the idea is the bull market is very hard to ride all the way up. Most people will see these big corrections and then the next time they see one, they'll sell out or just get out because they just can't handle the volatility. But the volatility now is just the precursor to the kind of volatility that we will see in the future. When we see, you know, $100 moves in gold, for example, in a day. Uh, and those days are ahead of us. Yeah, definitely uh, exciting times. But when these things happen, you know, those are when 
I get the comments, you know, Patrick, you said this, Patrick, you said that, you know, da, 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 da. and then I, I start getting in trouble sometimes, but I guess it comes with the, with the territory here. But it, David, back in earlier this year, January 2024, the Silver Institute put out that report saying uh, the global silver demand is forecasted to rise to 1.2 billion uh, shortage. Does this, should this start to ring the bell for people to, to buy silver or take a look at silver? It does, and it has. Um, like I said, the European, some of the European funds are buying physical silver. Can't remember the name of the fund, but they bought roughly 20 million ounces of physical. And when the uh, <clears throat> PSLV, the Sprott Physical Silver Trust, bought or ETF bought uh, silver, they bought it for um, about 22 million ounces. So it's right in line with that, which is a pretty good slug of silver. And then, you know, every every market moves at the margin. So that's 22 million ounces that will go in for investment purposes in strong hands. That's really not available for the, you know, solar panel industry, for example. So now that, you know, shortens the supply. And 1.2 billion ounces versus a total supply of 1 billion is a 200 million ounce deficit. You don't need too many 200 to 250 million ounce deficits to really start eating away at the above ground supply if those are the true deficits. And there's some argument about whether or not those numbers are true or false. Obviously, the Silver Institute <clears throat> Metals Focus and some other studies were incorrect uh, for 2023 on the amount of silver used in, in PV, photovoltaics. So there's been an adjustment made. And that will be reflected in the uh, the next study that comes out at the end of this month. I saw a, a recent interview you had with uh, our good friend Chris Marcus over at Arcadia Economics, and uh, you said something pretty interesting. Uh, it, it ought to make every investor or even non-investor take a pause for the cause of silver. You said, in theory, in theory, we will see industry alone will not have enough silver to meet demand. Can you go into this for us and, and we'll get it back in context? Sure, it comes from a guy named uh, Matt Watson. Uh, I became friends with him. I was introduced to the Silver Institute. And he does some really in-depth uh, work in all the physical commodities, that, or metals, I should say. He looks at a lot of the exotics like iridium and rhodidium and, and um, you know silver, gold, platinum, palladium. Uh, energy metals. He does a lot. And he does some really interesting work. And what he did was he put together a projection on the mining and recycling going out from now to 2050. So we're looking at the next 25 years in round numbers. And based on that projection and the projection of what's going to happen for all of the silver demand, meaning, you know, photovoltaics, but just we'll call it industrial demand, jewelry demand silverware demand, <clears throat> uh, that alone will take the total 1 billion ounces of silver, which is 850 by mining and 150 million by recycling, into a deficit situation, starting his initial chart, which I have, I have it in one of my presentations, and of course, give him credit, uh, was supposed to take place around 2025. Well, it actually took place in 2023 and is projected, as you just said, with 1.2 billion in 2024. So you have to shift the curve over, at least right now, in order to make it make sense because of, you know, our, our knowns. They're not projections anymore, they're givens. They're, it's given we used about 200 and what, I forget the exact number, 230 million ounces more than we were able to recycle and produce out of the, out of the mining industry. So when you do that, you see that we're in a deficit, not counting investment demand over the next basically 25 years. So that says, well, that's going to deplete the above ground supply. We already saw that happen for 15 years. From, nine, from 1990 to 2005, we had a 100 million ounce deficit for 15 years in a row on average. That was the average deficit. It wasn't exactly that number, but on average. 
So we went from 2 billion ounces above ground to 500 million. We lost 1.5 billion ounces of above ground stockpile. Now the above ground stockpile is maybe 3 billion. No one knows the exact number. And if we start depleting it at 200 million ounces a year, then uh, that will be 2 billion in 10 years, which will take us to 1 billion. But then you've got to factor in investment demand. And that could go crazy with the amount of paper money that's been printed, gold going nuts, people looking for alternative to gold investment, and then realizing that silver is in a deficit situation. So anything that they own will be, you know, putting more price pressure to the upside. So I'm still very bullish on silver. And even if he's wrong in his projections and the mining and recycling curve isn't flat for the next 25 years, which is what his projection says, uh, we still have a very dynamic situation, especially knowing that the monetary side or the safe haven status of silver is only going to improve from here, especially once it gets over the $30 mark and that 71 ratio that I outlined already. That's when you really get the signal that silver is being bought for investment purposes and the industrial side is not going to go away. In fact, we could get to a point where the investment side starts to create a, I would say shortage, but a tightening in the market to such a degree that big industrial users start to stockpile silver, just like hedge funds are, to make sure they don't run out of that essential element in order to stay in business. Right. And that's... Uh... A great point there. Um, as far as projections, I, I read briefly, I think it was in Bloomberg, where um, it, I, I forget which company, TD, or, or I think it was, was saying that uh, they're seeing maybe two years of above ground supply left for, for silver. Did, did you come across that? Yeah, I posted on Twitter. I think it was a little bit slanted, but I think the idea is correct. You know, we don't know. See, the problem with how much silver is there is one, the LBMA is pretty opaque. We don't, we get a number that they give us, so we'll assume that's correct. What we don't have is a category like having the COMEX. So we don't know how much of that silver is held by institutions that want to hold it for investment purposes and how much is free floating for industrial use. In the COMEX, we do. There's two categories there's eligible and registered. For the most part, it's only the registered category that's available for in, for investment, for, uh, excuse me, for any purpose, but primarily for industrial use. Whereas the eligible category is primarily investment. And the investment side is much larger in the COMEX warehouses than is the industrial base. And that's been depleted quite a deal since silver, the silver squeeze started a few years back. So we know that that's being depleted on aggregate on the whole. Yes, it got down to 30 million or less, and it's back up to 40 something. I haven't looked for a little while. But uh, also the depletion of the large ETFs like the SLV that I mentioned earlier. So a lot of this physical is going somewhere. And again, it's probably going into the industrial side and put in a product of some type. I mean, right now, the. Uh, semiconductor thing is sort of the rage with NVIDIA and all that they're, they're doing with their their new products and how much computing power they are and how powerful these new chips are and how they could be combined to two chips integrate with each other and act as one. I mean, it's fascinating what's going on on the, <clears throat> on the leading edge of the computer industry. And that alone is around a 50 million ounce market. It's gone from 44 million. So you know, there's a lot of stuff in the silver market that's just right in front of your face that people don't really know about because they're not students of the silver industry and realizing that uh, this is almost a gimme. I mean, there's not too many stock back, stock buyback programs that take in basically 30 or 40 percent of the float every year and buy it back. And that's what you could use as an analogy with the photovoltaics and add in the uh, semiconductor industry and if you want to throw on the icing on the cake add the 
the automotive, you've got a pretty substantive amount of industrial demand. Well, David, we're going into a recession, and you even said you think we're going into a depression, and you know there's not going to be as much demand for silver in the industrial side. That could be true, but it would also mean that probably the new silver supply coming above ground is going to be curtailed as well. Because, you know, if you're making, you're losing money on the, you know, mining of silver or labor costs go up or you see a depletion in your reserves or whatever, there'd be a lot of reasons that the kind of would work together, not necessarily in every case. But there's a lot out there that's favorable to the silver supply. And I'm probably going to take on uh, Matt's new study and get really deep into some of these numbers that you don't get from CPM or from uh, the Silver Institute and look uh, what his projections look like on a, um, not an aggregate basis, which he does in that graph I just described, but more in depth of how much are we looking at just on the computing power side with semiconductors, how much are we looking at just with photovoltaics, how much are we looking at with new solders or uh, some of the catalysts that we use, uh, what other new uses are potentially out there that will need to use silver above and beyond using any other elements. So there's a lot to it, but all of it's favorable to the silver market. And this is something that's just dawning on some of these funds right now. And they're also of a mindset that's unique in the in the industry, and that is I'd rather own the physical than a piece of paper that represents price movement. And that's what's really going to move the market. Yeah, um, you know, you're you're really making me think with everything you're saying that if 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 I were a businessman and I need silver, I I might just go directly to the mines and, and offer them a, a percentage of their their silver for X amount of years for uh, X amount in price. I mean, do you think this this happens is happening or will happen? Well, it's it's already happened. It's well known that uh, Avino Silver does that. I think it's Mitsubishi. I have to look it up. My memory's not as sharp as it once was, but they do have an agreement, offtake agreement with a main uh, silver user that rather than fitty dally around with somebody, they just go direct to the mine and they take it straight out of Avino's you know, stockpile and use it. And that's probably done in, uh, I'm sure it's done in other places. I don't know how many, uh, not very many. I know that, but um it's probably more subtle than being in the contract base of uh, you know what dis what's disclosed by Avino, but for the most part, no, they have direct relationship with the refiner. So X Y Z Silver Mine, be it Pan American, be it Fresneo, be it um, any of the other primary silver or byproduct miners that that produce a lot of silver, goes to the refiner and the industrial user buys it straight off of the refiner. And that's why when you see it deplete off of the COMEX or the ETFs or the LBMA, that's a big flag that, geez, they're not getting enough out of the refining industry. They have to go to above ground stockpiles in order to meet the demand. And that's a flag saying, wait a minute, we're starting to, it looks like at least we're starting to deplete the above ground stockpile to meet the demand. And that, is that a shortage? It's definitely a deficit. It does say that there's not enough demand on an annual, there's more demand on an annual basis than there is supply on an annual basis. And that demand has to be met by above ground stockpiles, which implies the above ground stockpiles are being depleted again. Just want to ask this question. I don't know the, the full ins and outs of this, but let's say when, when you do have these off day contracts, uh, you do have these these industries buying directly from from the refiners. Um, so let's say this this metal, this silver, never does hit the the markets, and therefore it may never move the price needle. The contracts are pretty interesting. Um, they vary. I haven't seen any. I've had some described to me. So like in the uh, I, if you know, you could probably look it up. I don't know what it is, but for example. A lot of these uh, contracts will be, we will pay you the average spot price over the last quarter. So they're not getting a high, you're not getting a low. So the average quarterly price for silver, let's say between 
April, May, and June. Let's pick a high number, like $28 is the average price. That's what these refiners will pay because they want to have the silver. They're price sensitive somewhat, but as I explained earlier, for the most part, they're price insensitive. I mean, they want to get it for a good price, but they also want to get it. It's getting it's more important than getting every last penny out of, you know, the cost. So they'll just do like a monthly, depends how the, what their delivery schedule is. It could be on a weekly basis. Depends what the user is and what their demands are and what the flow rate is. But it'll be a smooth curve so that both the refiner and the uh, end user is happy that they're both making, you know, a good deal for each other. I'm getting the price on an average for this month and you're paying the price on average for this month. Now, the way they manipulate or well let me restate that the way that they can um mitigate their cost is to go into the futures market and head say so well silver you know our analyst said that silver is a really good buy here at you know 25 so we're going to lock in our need for the next quarter silver at 25 and they actually pay 28 because silver did really well that quarter, well, they saved that $3 difference because they hedged in the futures market. And that happens all the time as well. But the problem is it works great on paper, but you know you can't put a piece of paper through the factory to produce a solar panel. So you know, there could be a time when that hedge fund that has 20 million ounces of silver and the manufacturer of solar panels gets desperate and says, Hey, we're not getting uh, the amount of silver we need. Silver is at 28. Uh, if we give you 30, will you take it? And the manager might say, yeah, we'll, we'll take 30. We'll take the $2 premium. How much do you want? Or we want, you know, 5 million ounces. So we take it on. So all these, some of that's theoretical, some of it's not. Uh, but yet you see where we could go with a, let's call it an industrial squeeze on the market coupled with a, financial squeeze on the market where if they combine, it could really shoot the silver price to new levels pretty easily, actually. And so let's say this uh, perfect storm, so to speak, happens. Are we going to be able to to go down to our mom and pop store, wherever it is, and, and pick up some silver? Or is there going to be some scarcity for, for retail investors at this point? It'll be like any market. There'll be um, spots where you can and spots where you can't. Uh, your big, big dealers will probably always have some inventory, but it'll get more and more exclusive, meaning, uh, I want to buy this amount. Well, I could give you this much now. You have to wait for the rest. Well, I want to buy it now. Well, we've got these rare coins. I mean, it will be spotty. Um, as far as, you know, the retail market, it could dry up pretty fast. But it's price dependent too. I mean, there's a lot of people that pay huge premiums that are waiting to get out of their silver position or lighten it up because they bought too much at the wrong time. Uh, silver Eagles are a pretty good example. But uh, we could see once that gets worked through, which again, it could happen fairly quickly in a hot market, then, uh, then we're on our way because now everybody's sitting at you know $33 silver and they're at least, you know, break even with their Silver Eagles and everything else they own is at a profit. And the profit's just beginning because their average price is $29 an ounce, you know, full price. They bought it at 26 and paid a $3 premium or they bought it at 25 and had a $4 premium. Or whatever. So now they're break even. So they're not going to sell. And now Silver's tighter because there's, the retail guys are not going to sell. And the wholesale market's been bought off. And all of a sudden, as I've said once before, I said this quite some time ago. I think Rick Rule said something similar. and Maybe he took it from me. Maybe not. doesn't matter. But there'll be a lot more silver bought above $30 an ounce U.S. than it was below 30 People buy markets that move. People buy higher prices. And that's how all commodities and stocks really move. Because when you get a new high, people, if everyone owns it at a new high, and they're in the profit zone, they tend not to sell. They tend to hold. And when they hold on to it, that means any new buying pressure, be it just a small amount, bids the price higher. 
to get a new, new high. So everybody that's holding still holds because it's a new, new high. How much higher is it going to go? There will always be an ebb and flow. I mean, there'll be people that will sell back at any price because they need it. They need the cash or they're sick of the market or the wife's nagging them or the fund is moving into biotech and leaving the commodities market or whatever. So there are always a two-way market, but it can be very, very tough to get new sellers into a market as a market's making a new high. And silver is especially noted for that. As we witnessed back in the 2011 market between like March 1st and the end of April, early May 2011, we got a pretty good run up. And that was mostly paper driven at that point. So as we are seeing now, really. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Um, You've pretty much seen it all when it comes to silver. And with this particular run up for silver, does it remind you of something that you've seen before? Or is this something totally, completely different this time? No, it's something I've seen before. I mean, I saw something similar in the end of 79 in the 1980. You know, I mean, we had the my mys, you know, my my silver keeps going higher. My my silver keeps going higher. My my, what's going on in the silver market? Oh my goodness, something's wrong with the silver market. What's happening? And we saw that to a lesser degree in the 2011 spike, but same situation. Like, what's going on? How come it keeps going up? You know, I mean, people talk about manipulation a lot, and I certainly have. I wrote about it in the Silver Manifesto, but. Um, Markets do move both ways, and whether it's being manipulated or not, you could argue one way or the other, but uh, the point being is that when you start to make a new high and everyone's holding, any buying pressure really will move the market, and then you get to, well, where's the top, and that's always a tough one. I happen to call the top all the way up so far. Whether I'll do it again or not remains to be determined. I plan to like filter out, but I don't think 50 is going to be the top this time. It could be a temporary top. We could see somewhere around the $50 level and it sells off. and sells off hard maybe. It goes to 50, 51, 87, and then drops to 42, 20. And people get disgusted because that all took place in a matter of three trading weeks or something. So, oh my goodness, I should have sold at 50. I knew better, blah, 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 thinking that that's the top. And then it consolidates in the low 40s or something and then moves back up. And all of a sudden it breaks through 50 for the first time and stays there. And then it continues to move up. So a lot going on, a lot to be optimistic about. Even Phillips Baker that was interviewed by Matt Watson on Kitco a while back. I know I'm hopefully not allowed to say that on, on your channel, but he talked about $100 silver. I mean, you don't hear a CEO of a major silver miner that's listed on the New York Stock Exchange talk about $100 silver and consider him to be a crackpot. He's not, obviously. So I think we have a lot to look forward to. Is it going to be a Bitcoin move? No. Is it going to be, um, you know, some of these other cryptos? No. Is it going to be NVIDIA? No. But we take silver seriously as a monetary metal. The investor side does. And as a as the ultimate hedge, because if everything else is going down and silver is going up, um, it may be the last man standing in some portfolios. So it's worth having some. I think the biggest problem with most silver investors that are discouraged is buying too much, buying the wrong type, and buying at the wrong time. Yeah, I hear you. I I hear that all all the time. Um, one one last question here. Um, you mentioned monetary metal. Do do you think we'll see a return to precious metals as money, either in physical or perhaps digital form? Well, digital form is taking place now. It's certainly not a big adoption to it, but there's some that have do it and use it. Um, as far as in physical form, uh, yes. I mean, there's, and I'm going to do a podcast here. In fact, I got to get going on it. I've been promising it for a few months. But there's been several states here in the United States that allow silver to be silver or gold and or gold to be used in any transaction as long as both parties agree. So that's already uh, on the books and legal. So the answer is yes. And I think what's really makes the impetus take place is further depreciation of the currencies worldwide. 
and ease of use. And really the ease of use is to put silver in the depository and issue a debit card against it and or put silver in the depository and issue a digital cryptocurrency behind it. And with those two ways to implement it, it uh, makes it mitigates the problem of putting the silver eagle on the counter and saying, I want to buy this, you know, these two books or whatever. Uh, because then what do you do? <clears throat> what price do you use? Um, what do you give change in? And all that. All that circumvented if you just back it with silver and let, you know, the terms and conditions work, which you get the close of the LBMA at that evening as your standard price. And you are paid back in the fiat equivalent. Um, and, you know, away you go. Or, or you actually don't even get change. You basically just mitigate in grams or grains the exact amount of silver to fiat equivalent based on the LBMH uh, fix. And everybody's happy. And there's nothing wrong with doing it that way because the price of silver does move up and down. But so is the price of the dollar vis a vis. The currency exchange rate, but no one really thinks about that. They just think I'm spending dollars. But in a way, it does vary as well. So it would work quite easily. In fact, there are some systems that are set up, as I said earlier, but they're not well known and they're not taken advantage of. But as things deteriorate more, you'll see more and more people run to the gold and silver markets and they will start to take on these more, let's say, um, useful tools to be able to actually spend it. All right. Let's. Uh... Let's hope this happens. Would like to uh, have a silver debit card, David. Before we head out, and I got to get you to, to that podcast. Can you let the people know how they can follow you and see more of your work? Sure. The first place is the morganreport dot com. Just be sure to get on our free email list, and then the next best place is probably on Twitter at silverguru twenty two. And the last place is take a look at the documentary I'm making with others uh, called uh, silversunrise dot tv. That's a uh, documentary about the fear and stress and control of money and how to overcome it. We're working on that documentary as I speak. All right. Look forward to that. David, I want to thank you again for your time. And, and again, insights. So you give it like no other. So I appreciate that. And uh, I look forward to doing this again soon. Well, thank you, Patrick. So it's fun to be with you. That was David Morgan sharing his views on silver and the economy. To see more of David's views and work, please go to www.themorganreport.com. If you like this video, please do subscribe, give it a thumbs up, and share. All are greatly appreciated. Audio-only versions of this interview can be found on iTunes and Spotify.